Hey everyone, my name is Denise Brown. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is our third annual Beginning Again Retreat. And we're gonna start off with another Denise who's gonna help us with the right words to use to respond when we hear the wrong words. So Denise, take it away. Hi everybody, good morning. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for investing your time to be here with me as well. I am uh, joining you from Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, so it's lovely to see all of your faces and uh, your presence here, your hearts. I would like to start by saying that uh, the land I live and work on is Treaty 4 territory. And I would like to honor that. It's the traditional lands of the um, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, the Cree, and the homeland of the Métis people. Sorry for your loss. Um, so we hear this quite often in our society and people who show up and say it to us, they come from the biggest of hearts and the most caring that they can. And I wonder amongst all of us if it sometimes loses its impact. Uh, we see it in our social media and you'll see if somebody posts that somebody has died, that you'll see, sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss. And so I wonder how that lands with many of you. Again, it comes from a great place. Um, as we investigate the right things, the wrong things, I have a tendency to try not to qualify <laughs> the right ways or the wrong things, but what I like to sit with is why might some of those words impact us? And if we could reflect about why some of those words might impact us, it might better allow us to show up when we feel um, some of that discomfort or some of that ick or some of that, um, when you walk away from a conversation, you're like, I don't feel great about that and I didn't feel supported. So I'm hoping we can investigate a little bit of that so that when it shows up for you again in the future, you have a little bit, ah, I recognize this feeling. And then you can choose how you wish to address it. And we'll talk about some of those words as well. So part of the reason that we hear oftentimes, sorry for your loss is because we don't really talk about death much anymore uh, in our society. We no longer, I'm generalizing, but we no longer have that intergenerational living where we have grandparents and aunts and uncles living with us. So we've lost what natural life progression looks like. And with not being able to be present in that national life, natural life progression, we've also lost how to be comfortable in those conversations. So sorry for your loss. We're not saying, sorry, your person has died. We don't say death. We do not use those D words. Um, when we see, and, and by the way, if anybody wants to interact in chat or verbally, I am so open to this. So I, I will just open that as well. But I would love if anybody's willing in the chat right now, if you think about how death is depicted in movies or books, what are the some of the themes that show up? If you think about it and start paying attention to the way we see death and dying in our movies and our television. Um, I will say that what I notice and pay attention to is um, either traumatic, scary, fearful, or what I see often is also the romanticized ideal of death. Movies don't necessarily depict the reality exactly. Thanks, Denise. They are gone and a week later, life is normal except for hysterical public outbursts. Yeah, thanks both. Um, so what we also see in death in that's not reality, uh, Denise has said, is we might see like think of turns in Derriment or any of those things where it's almost romanticized. Cue the music. The person is dying and we get those final last words that just put a nice bow around everything and then we leave. The issue with that is the way it's portrayed is we're building expectations without realizing it. So a lot of people who are next to their people who are dying, they're wait, wait a minute, I didn't get my last words. Wait a minute, I didn't get the closure that I needed. Wait a minute, I didn't. So I'm hoping with some of these conversations and also being here today, we can have an understanding why people show up saying sorry for your loss. It's because we've lost our ability to talk about it and because we're not really showing it as well. I would like to, if you're willing, um, when you start noticing 
comments that come your way and it tweaks you a little bit, um, take a moment to actually notice where you're feeling that in your body. And if anybody's willing to share in the chat again, where do you feel it? Is it in your tummy? Is it in your chest? Is it a pit? How does that feel? The reason I asked the question is next time that physical symptom shows up of somebody talking to you, Chinese culture does not use D words. We do not, we not me say he, she left. Thank you, Penny. It's a frustration. So I feel it in my head. Excellent. The reason I ask that too is when you start to feel it and it shows up, you're like, ah, wait a minute, I think I might know where this is coming from. So we feel the discomfort. I'm going to share a little cartoon with you um, that hopefully portrays discomfort, but also how people might uh, show up in listening. I've been feeling so down lately. Say something comforting. Nothing matters to me. Give her advice. I'm so anxious and depressed. Tell her it's going to be okay. I just want to be happy again. Try and fix it. Anyways, thanks for being here. Say something. It's nice to be with someone that just listens. Nailed it. Um, two reasons I like showing this is A, are we actively listening when we have a whole conversation going on in our head? Probably not. However, in this cartoon, what I love about it is what we need is for someone to sometimes not say anything at all, <laughs> right? And to show up and to be fully present and to be able to hold space for us. And when I say hold space, it means allowing yourself to be in that discomfort with me, right? That's the best thing that can happen sometimes. Okay. I just need to catch up on my own slides here. So again, trying to recognize when we have that discomfort and how it shows up, there is something that I send off to clients quite often where they're like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. And I love this article. So I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it before, but it's called The Ring Theory. And it was created by Susan Silk and Barry Goleman. And Susan Silk, um, she was struggling with breast cancer. And she was recognizing that when she was trying to speak to other people, oftentimes it became about them. I'll give you an example. Um, myself, I there was a lump in my breast and I was getting a mammogram and then they brought me into the ultrasound and there's a long history in my family of breast cancer. And when I reached out to let my mom know, as one does, my mom started crying and saying, no, not you too. And what happens in that scenario when I'm having a conversation and the person that I'm on the receiving end is you end up comforting them. So what I like about this ring theory is we're all going to be in the nucleus at some point. We're all going to be at the center where we are the person who is afflicted in some capacity, either through grief, either through loss, either through change. And if we recognize that when we are in that um, crisis or in that moment of needing extra support, it's important to realize that there is what's this ring theory. So if we're in the middle, it's great to start building your circle of support. So that's the next circle next to behind you, like right after would be your closest people who you call family. Then after that, it might be your coworkers, and it might be the people that you have hobbies with, but you keep bringing your comfort around you. When we feel that ick, or when we feel that um, walk away from a conversation not, like not supported, it's generally, because in the ring theory, the, the role is to always bring comfort into the person in the center. If you need support, so in the example I gave about my mom, if my mom was feeling anxious, she can always reach out to the circle that's beyond her so that she can only bring comfort in. Um, I hope I'm explaining this in a way that is registering for everybody. So the ideal is for ring theory, you always bring comfort in. If you need to dump, if you have your own anxiety or your own fears, you reach out to the bigger circle behind you. 
when you're feeling things that uh, feel off, it's probably because the circles are out of whack. The comfort isn't coming in. Is this, does this analogy work for, are we? Yeah, okay. So does a family potentially look like Olympic rings where there's overlap? There can be overlap for sure, uh, because everybody in a situation will need their own support. But it's important for the family to recognize too who's at the nucleus. So if it's somebody who's in hospice and palliative care, that person becomes the person we're all bringing comfort to. Of course, there might be the Olympic rings where some people need more support, but we all make sure that we're always bringing comfort into the person who's at the forefront. And then we reach out. So as your siblings, there probably will be some of those Olympic rings where you're going back and forth to bring support to each other. But mom or dad, whoever is in, let's say the hospice, that person always brings the comfort in. Um, I put the article in my PowerPoint and I will share the PowerPoint afterwards with Denise if she wants so that people can have it so that you can read about this article too. Um, another way I like looking at it too is when we get um, a little bit twinged is that maybe our canvas isn't being respected. Maybe the people who are sitting with us is not allowing us to paint our own canvas. So when somebody might show up and be saying things like, I know how you're feeling. Well, actually you don't because you are not me and you don't know the interactions I've had with my person. My person is unique, I am unique. Therefore the conversations we've had, no one else can have those, right? No one else in the world can have that. I appreciate that you're trying to empathize but somebody might be painting our canvas. So I like to use this as a reflection, not only for when we have a bit of a flinch but also for you moving forward in your own lives, start paying attention to when you might be painting someone else's canvas. So for instance, I'm showing up and I'm looking and I see Mia, hi Mia, and I go, oh Mia, I can tell you're angry right now. And Mia's like, what? I'm not angry, right? So I would be painting Mia's canvas. There's another way that people can show up and saying, Mia, I see some emotions. Can you explain what's going on, right? So asking questions in a way where we're not painting somebody else's uh, canvas can help. Looking at the time. So language matters. Um, I'd like to say that everything becomes heightened in language with the weight of grief. And, you know, the first slide, first slides that I talked about death and how we don't talk about it in our society. The more we can start talking about it, some of that weight can lift. So I correlate it a little bit to the Me Too movement or mental health when we talk about issues. The more we can openly and in a safe container talk about it, the more freedom there is for the person in front of us, but also some of the weight they carry is lifted because they're able to talk in a safe environment. Uh, being mindful is, uh, I would love for all of us to start paying attention to that language that might um, flinch. So, we often hear, um, my person has committed suicide or um, they committed suicide. And I want us to think about that for a moment. The committed suicide part comes from language that we've just known for a long time. Committed was because it used to be against the law. It's no longer um, language that really helps anyone because it adds extra taboo to a family that's already grieving. And so if we can start trying to be mindful of saying, died by suicide um, and, and naming it that way. Other language that you might pay attention to is somebody might saying they're refusing treatment. And when we hear they're refusing treatment, how does that make people respond or feel in this room? To me, it sounds like somebody who's being disobedient, a disobedient child versus I am choosing natural, I'm choosing to die naturally, right? Um, life support, they are going off life support. We mean well, but I want us to think of the language we use there as well. It's not life support, it's medical support. So when we say we're taking them off life support, we are left with the illusion that um, we're taking their life, right? So I want us to start paying attention to those languages as well. Now, here's the thing that we hear often that I want us to think about. So either we're sitting with somebody and they are going to maybe say nothing because of the discomfort, but they may say sorry for your loss. 
And it's not a bad thing. Again, it comes from a place of heart, a place of caring and not knowing what to say. But if you're in a place where you can ask and you wish to hear, it might be nice to say, can you tell me about my person? Can you tell me about a favorite memory? Can you tell me about the impact that they have in your life? Um, if you have the capacity to do so. How, when we hear a story for your loss, everybody in this room, has it lost its impact for you? As I take a drink of coffee. The reason I bring this up also is not again only for what we hear, but also for what we say to others. Yes, just a very weak phrase that seems meaningless. Exactly, Sandra. Um, and so we know why we say it. We say it because it's 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 we're feeling uncomfortable, right? We're feeling uncomfortable, so we don't know what to say. But I have made it a habit, and I hope that all of us leaving uh, today will make it a habit that when um, we are in the presence of someone else who is grieving. It might be nice to say, do you know what I loved about Eric? I loved that whenever he went running, he never wore shoes. And it took 30 seconds for me to say that, not even. But it tells the person across from me that I have noticed your person, right? I have noticed them. They have a personality and they're unique. So when we hear, at least they aren't suffering, again, that comes from a person who wants to support us, who wants us to feel better. But in our lives, whenever we hear at least, Heather, is this on, sorry for your loss, or at least they aren't suffering? I, I, may I explore that with you a little bit? Oh, sorry for your loss, yes. I carry the memory of them. Perfect, thank you. At least they aren't suffering. Um, if we go back to that, somebody painting our picture unintentionally, but somebody is painting our picture because they're making the picture only at least they aren't suffering. And I don't know if that has tweaked anybody here, but generally when we are journeying with somebody, um, the whole last few years or last few months, isn't only suffering. There has been some loving moments. There has been some laughter. There has been some cuddles and we are still living. And so if we can, um, if somebody is saying at least they aren't suffering and it triggers you or it causes you to have emotion, say there was also love, right? And it, it helps people shift and go, oh, okay, right? And I'd like you to tell, tell you about some of that. I'm not going to go through all the different ones we hear, but here are just some that I picked. How are you? How do we handle? I find that I have to choose my words depending on who I am talking to. For sure, Penny. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes it's okay to say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say, but I am, I'm here and I want to be here with you. And, and that will go a long way too. How are you? That can be a loaded one because we don't know if the person who's asking the question really wants to hear how we're doing. Uh, secondly, it can be loaded because we might not have the energetic capacity to actually answer that authentically and truthfully. And so it would be nice to have, I'm thinking of you, I'm checking in on you, you're in my heart, you're in my thoughts, depends on your beliefs, you might hear you're, you're in my prayers also. Um, I know how you feel. I touched on that. It's impossible for others to know how I feel. We are as unique as our grief and our fingerprints. If you need anything is another one we often hear from people. Um, I would ask that anybody who is a caregiver or anybody who is grieving, that we uh, start maybe our own list right? Uh, that we start our own list of oh, frustration. I don't even know how to light up my own barbecue. And, and that causes us such angst and, and frustration. But when we have that, and if we could just put a list, because our great brain can't always come with an answer with somebody who says, if you need anything. But if you write down that, then you might be saying, you know what? I don't know how to light a barbecue. Can you please come over? 
For the opposite, for those who are supporting people and we want to say if you need anything, what I would recommend is be really specific. Um, but with choice, choice is always empowering for those who support. So for instance, I am going to the grocery store. Can you please open your fridge and tell me what you need? I will pick it up for you. So we're guiding them and being specific. Or next week, I would like to order food for you. Which night works best? I was thinking pizza or chicken wings. You're being specific, but you're helping them guide in a choice where it's not like I have to come up with what I can say because the grief brain is very, very difficult. Um, is there any in the group that wants to share like one that they hear time and time again that we want to explore? A sentence that... And Penny, I'm gonna go back to you what you say. I find I have to choose my words depending on who I am talking to. Absolutely. So it's always great to reflect after you walk away from a conversation, but also if you can remember the ring theory of coming, of coming in, um, then you'll know if I'm bringing comfort in, you're generally going to be saying the right thing. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for your comment. Um, here's something that we can say when others don't know what to say, and you can say, be still with me. Um, and I do want to share this and honor this. This is a client uh, legacy project we did where we had uh, a best friend and a client work together. And this is a childhood painting of them. But I, I like this picture, so I want to honor it that way. I'm going to, I see it's 821. So I'm going to um, read a last poem that I have on my fridge to remember about empowering, but also about listening. Um, in it, the word God is in it. So if that word um, is not one that sits well with you, please change it for when I meditate or when I look in nature, whatever feels right for you. Listen, by Leo Bascaglia. When I ask you to listen to me and you start giving me advice, you have not done what I asked. When I ask you to listen to me and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you are trampling on my feelings. When I ask you to listen to me and you feel you have to do something to solve my problem, you have failed me, strange as that may seem. Listen, all I ask is that you listen. Don't talk or do, just hear me. And I can do for myself. I'm not helpless, maybe discouraged and faltering, but not helpless. When you do something for me that I can and need to do for myself, you contribute to my fear and in inadequacy. But when you accept as a simple fact that I feel what I feel, no matter how irrational, then I can stop trying to convince you that uh, trying to convince you and I can get about this business of understanding what's behind this irrational feeling. And when that's clear, the answers are obvious and I don't need advice. Irrational feelings make sense when we understand what's behind them. So please listen and just hear me. And if you wanna talk, wait a minute for your turn and I will listen to you. Thank you. We have two minutes left for my time. And if there are any questions or any thoughts or any comments. This need for someone to jump in and fix us is frustrating because we're not wrong. And I remind individuals all the time, listening is the solution. If you want to solve our problem, simply listen. That's the solution. And people think it has to be much more complicated than that. And it is as simple as just simply listening. Thank you. I will add to that. If we allow for the pause, um, and you allowed to pause and let me catch up to what's coming out of my mouth, without censoring it, then I go, oh, and I can catch up to my own, right? And digest my own. So yes, exactly. Which is so interesting because pauses during a conversation are actually very effective. And we oftentimes feel like we have to fill the pause with words that actually take away from the purpose of the conversation. Exactly. Okay, thank you so much, Denise. Thank you so much. I'm gonna just stop. Our recording.